good day to you all. Very happy to be back here in Christchurch. I was here last year for the uh, TEDx, and that was a wonderful occasion. And this year I'm on the other side of the footlights, and happy to do that too. The message today has to do with fostering innovation. When I've revisited New Zealand after working for 40 years at the Media Lab at MIT, where we had innovation happening in a very rapid pace, I found that in New Zealand here, it's a little slow to get going, um, in part because of the view that people have of innovation. And um, I'll be dealing with that as we go along. But first of all, what um, I did when I went to the US was to do a PhD in music. Then I became composer in residence in a, up in Seattle in a bunch of schools. Then I was conductor um, of a, of a um, conference, music conference, a US music conference in Seattle. And then um, I went back to the East Coast again and taught at Yale University. Um, in the middle of the work that I had done at, in Seattle, I developed quite a technique of having computers participate in the music performances, uh, particularly making uh, special sounds that no one else had sort of heard at that time. And so while I was at Yale, um, I got a call from the people at MIT who thought that what I was doing with computers, this was in 1971, um, uh, was unlike anything that they had in, up, in, up at MIT. And they decided that a musician could actually teach computer scientists a thing or two. And so I was invited to MIT to join the faculty, and then I built an um, experimental music studio. And um, that went on for quite a while. I was um, helping students um, create pieces, and we did lots and lots of concerts, etc. But then um, a lot of us around MIT decided that um, computers in the arts was a nice combination, and we decided to build a lab called the Lab for Computer in the Arts. Immediately, the computer science department said to us, you can't do that, that's our word. Oh, um, so we then decided on something like media, which was a um, nasty word at that time, uh, media lab, and they said, okay, you can have that. And so that's what started the, the media lab at MIT. <clears throat> and from the visions that we had now, there were <clears throat> um, several things that have made a big impact on, on the world in this area. Um, first of all, the Media Lab was, was one of these things. Then something else that I was involved in was the One Laptop Per Child um, educational project. And then lastly, and you'll hear about that too, the Econest Corporation. So first of all, in the Media Lab itself, this is the first building we made uh, with money from Japan, actually. And uh, there was a lot of room there. We had a lot of students doing all kinds of different things. And then, um, once we had this lab there, I decided I needed some good PhD students. First one I discovered, or one of the early ones, was somebody by the name of Joe, Joe Pompey, who had the idea that he would build an audio spotlight, that is to say a loudspeaker, that would project sound only in one direction, just like a laser beam. So it works something like this. There's an ordinary loudspeaker and its output of sound. And here's what a laser beam uh, would do. Um, the laser beam sound, essentially, is putting sound on an on ultrasound beam, very narrow beam, and the sound is encoded in that. And what happens is that the um, air is not a very good carrier of the ultrasound, and it breaks up as after it's gone a few hundred meters, and then the audible sound falls out as a byproduct. So with this loudspeaker, you don't hear it if you're standing up close, but if, as you get further away, the sound gets louder. Well, it's also a, like a little pencil of sound. You can hear it, but you wouldn't. I could point at you, but you wouldn't hear it, etc. So it's a, it's a very different sort of uh, phenomenon. And um, Joe um, was able to uh, show how this could be used. You can, you can direct the sound and direct the audio in different ways. And then um, applications to put this in, in uh, cars. For instance, you could put uh, these loudspeakers up in the ceiling, and then each passenger, the driver and the passengers, and all uh, the three other passengers, would all hear something different. That would mean four CD players in the dash. You know, <laughs> <laughs> now, these speakers actually 
were pretty expensive to develop. They cost about $10,000, all handmade. And so if you bought four of these speakers, then you'd paid $40,000 for the audio, and you hadn't bought the car yet. <laughs> so, um, but that, that proceeded, and we got uh, lots of uh, interesting interest from the audio, audio makers. They, they thought this was a bit excessive. I then brought this thing down to um, Adelaide. I'm a composer, and I had something on the Adelaide Festival, and I brought these speakers down here. Uh, to, uh, to, to the um, South Australian Museum. And what happens is that um, with three speakers pointing at different places and also a lenticular display, the thing that you see on the, um, in that yellow box, that's a display that shows different things depending where you stand. You stand here and you see one thing, move a little bit here and you see something else and then something else from here. In fact, if you're standing on this side here, um, you would maybe see a jazz trumpeter and you'd hear a jazz trumpeter. Move over here, you'd see and hear a jazz singer and over here, you'd see and hear a jazz pianist or something different, jazz trumpeter. Um, now, um, that gave rise to the in-place performers idea and uh, it was really a very successful thing. The next thing we did was to um, take this up to Hearn Bay in Auckland, where we um, had some of these speakers up above a, a sales uh, thing in the grocery store. And you'll see what, the, what happens when... talk to you about something, something really important. Fair trade. Look at them all. Those bananas in front of you, so many to choose from. But which should you buy? I know. And you do too. They're all good bananas. They're the only fair trade ones. So now you know which ones to choose, make a good choice. <laughs> So, where do innovations like this come from? They just don't appear in the normal education labs, etc. Uh, in fact, it, um, ideas like this come from a clash of cultures. At the Media Lab in Boston, we have lots and lots of students from all different cultures around the world, um, lots of disciplines and different ways of doing things. That gives rise to innovative thoughts, a lot of lateral thinking. That happens in such a culture. What are the deterrents of something like that? There are deterrents. For instance, walls and buildings are deterrents of this kind of thinking, the lateral thinking. Funding streams, you can't work on this because you're paid to work on that. That's very bad. Measure the success. You shouldn't uh, measure the success of what, what you're doing. It should be just free and open. And also mid-level management. That, they're bad also. <laughs> <laughs> they're usually protecting their own tails. Um, so the question is, how can we foster innovations? Um, it turns out that if we create an, a very wide open lab with lots of um, things happening and where we maximize the lateral connections between things, then we have these innovations just happening of their own occurred. Um, you, don't, you can't um, authorize or, or um, innovation say, you, you have to do some innovating over here. It just doesn't work that way. So there need to be lots of experiments, of course. So you need to encourage experiments and uh, also avoid prescriptive goals. I've seen innovations in New Zealand here that happens like this. Somebody says, oh, there's the problem. Let's innovate a solution to that problem. And everybody goes marching down that same road, all in the same direction. Nobody's looking laterally at all. And what you end up with is problem solving. That's not innovation, that's just problem solving. So um, you have to be very careful how you approach these things. I did something myself, which was kind of crazy. Um, I was working with some DSPs there, little signal processing chips. I had six of these high-speed chips on a high-speed bus doing very, very fast calculations. And uh, it was processing audio. And from that, we actually made a karaoke machine. And uh, here's the karaoke machine. Uh, it's a fancy-looking thing. It was fairly expensive. It was about $1,200 to buy. And uh, there were 
several thousands of these sold up in Japan. Um, and uh, it was about a quarter of a billion of manufactured product. They never sold it outside Japan. Um, but some of the things that um, work with this, so this was the world's first software only karaoke machine or audio product for that matter just software only no hardware normally these um, machines have hardware ASICs and things inside there but this one didn't it's all in software and that gives you a lot of flexibility in fact, um, I was then producing um, um, backgrounds to famous singers. Also. In fact, here's one for Whitney Houston. This is Whitney's first ever song, her first hit, uh, You Give Good Love. And you can hear the background. We duplicated what the band that uh, Whitney was using in, in this machine. And uh, it's a good quality sound that the Japanese insist on. karaoke machine is that if you're um, if you speed up and slow down the machine goes with you now that normally doesn't happen if you all of you have sung in the, <laughs> with the karaoke, karaoke machine you better listen very carefully to the machine to sure as hell it's not listening to you and you can quickly fall on your face but this one does listen to you you speed up and you slow down you can ham it up in front of your friends and do all sorts of things in fact when doing that if you sing a wrong note your voice is, of course, coming out through the loudspeakers, but it comes out as the right note. <laughs> so, in fact, I found, I found that you didn't have to sing at all. You could just speak the words, <laughs> and my machine would put the, every vowel or every consonant, every sound at the right pitch, and it sounded wonderful. Now, the Japanese didn't like this. <laughs> they, they said, that's not fair. Um, we have a way of sort of competing against ourselves. You get a score, six out of ten or something, you try to improve that score next time around. That was their idea of how to really interact with technology. Anyway, uh, the next thing I did was then to develop, I was part of a development of a thing called the One Laptop Per Child. This was intended to be aimed at all of the children of the world who didn't have access to technology. This was about eight, nine years ago, and we produced this laptop. For, didn't quite get down to $100, about $120 or something like that was the closest. But there were 600,000 of these we made, put them around the world. In Australia, we put uh, 60 of these, six, sorry, 60,000 of these around uh, outback Australia with the help of the government. And uh, mostly in remote Aboriginal villages and things like that. I found it just very rewarding to be doing that sort of thing and in bringing it to New Zealand. What I actually did with this one laptop a child company um, was to put um, Te Reo Māori as the front end. And it was very appealing, of course, to the um, um, Te Reo, uh, the Total Immersion Māori schools. Um, what was different about this was that it had a lot of um, free and open source software, learning through design. That's a school in, in uh, Coromandel, just south of Coromandel, called uh, Manaya. They have, at that school, all of this, the whole school has these laptops, I would say, with the Toreo Māori as the, as the access into them. The thing on the right uh, here, this one, um, if you go into a school with lots of devices, you'll find you've quickly run out of wall plugs and to power these things. So I invented this machine here that um, allows you to charge 75, uh, 75 of these um, in, in with one wall plug. And so that was a big help. Now, then we decided that we, had, we needed a new media lab at MIT, and this is the one we built. It had lots of um, labs all interlaced like this, so that from each lab you could actually look down at other labs and see what was going on. So this was our idea of ensuring that there was lateral connection between all the research that was happening. Okay, and then um, 
The question, what should children learn? Or perhaps better yet, what should, machi uh, what should machines learn? They should learn acoustic skill and understanding, being able to f figure out what was going on in, with the singers, um, or um, with linguistic analysis of the chat rooms. Now, about six, eight years ago, um, I gave two graduate students a rack of 10 or 12 machines, IBM machines, and they were surfing the web. This is the time when <clears throat> people were stealing MP3 files, and my kids were looking at what was going on. Now, they weren't stealing anything, but they were looking at what the kids were saying about these things. And they had figured out through linguistic analysis of what the chat rooms were really saying. In other words, they understood the buzz of what was, ha what was happening. And they could actually predict who was going to be top of the charts about two weeks in advance. So that um, this is the, the two-week um, projection. The red line is, is the, what the um, trade journals were saying. The blue line, well, what my two students were working out, they had predicted who was going to be top of that. Now, they thought they had a business there. They said, no. I said, no, you have to go back and finish your PhD. And then, <laughs> and then, then we'll see about a business. Then after they'd finished, they came to me and said, OK, we're ready to go. And I said, yes, you've got what it takes. Go for it. And they said, well, we don't have any money. I said, well, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I've got a house that I could mortgage. So I mortgaged my house in Boston, first mortgage, second mortgage, and then gave them all the money. And so they gave them about half a million to the US to sort of start off their company. They didn't really have what it took. They needed a CEO to actually drive this company. And, I, and so I looked around, found a, talked to a few people, didn't like what they were saying. And in the, in, in the end, I said, the person you need is your CEO is the drummer in my son's band. He's got a, uh, a law degree, he's a lawyer, and he's a good musician, and he's the one who should lead this thing. And so he, they took him on, and it was with my money, I suppose it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Jim, as his name was, led this group to become really quite successful. They, starting from the amount of money I gave them, they then built up a lot more um, sponsors and things, and when it got up to about 40 or 50 million, and by then they had all sorts of, this was the Echoness, it was called. By the time they got up to that um, um, amount of funding, they had lots of uh, um, uh, clients, I suppose you call them, customers. Um, Spotify, MTV were the clients. Then at some point, Spotify came to them and said, we want it all, which meant they wanted to buy up the company and keep it all to themselves. I said to Jim, put on your boxing gloves and talk to, and talk to Spot Up. He came back after a week and said, I said, what, what happened there? And they, they said, they've offered us 99 million to take over the company. It seemed a good re return on investment. <laughs> <laughs> and, <clears throat> and then um, Apple came in the following week and said, we'll give you 100 million. But you have to move the whole company from Boston out to Cupertino. Now, all the researchers, 75 of them, said, we've got houses and kids in school, we can't do that. And so we went with the um, Spotify uh, offer and ended up with Spotify shares. And so that's where it stands. Spotify, of course, hasn't done an IPO, so we don't know how much these shares are worth, but I suspect they will, they will do OK. So, so what I'm... <laughs> So, so what I'm saying here is that um, it pays to support younger students because they have all the good ideas, particularly the crazy ones. The crazy ones, <laughs> crazy ones are often the hardest to manage, but they've got all the good ideas, so put up with it. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, about, that's the takeaway for today, is to um, maximize lateral connections and avoid prescriptive goals. Don't go after things that are already, you already know the ending. Just let the, the mind just flow and come up with new innovative things. And that's how to support uh, innovation. Thank you.